Hello everyone and let's discuss Prehistoric Planet Episode 3, Freshwater. I will be discussing the entire episode and sharing my thoughts on it, so obviously there are spoilers in this video. The Freshwater episode is all about fresh water, but freshwater is a pretty big umbrella term. And it is again a very varied environment, in spite of the fact that they decided to focus in, hone in on singular themes like fresh water. And when we follow one of those rivers, we end up at a waterfall and sheer cliff where pterosaurs are nesting. But the pterosaurs are not exactly the star of this particular scene. We have the return of the Velociraptor, which was introduced first in the previous desert episode. Interestingly, the, the freshwater episode handles the introduction of the Velociraptor like it is the very first time. We even have a similar first reveal shot of showing the feet, like the, the famous sickle claw first. And the way David Attenborough just says its name it, it really emphasizes it and that felt a little bit weird considering that these episodes are back to back just one day apart i'm like yeah that's a philosophy we've seen this we we know this you you showed us yesterday we know this now so it looks like the episodes are made for like single consumption that's i guess the best way i can put it you know you can you can watch one episode and not watch anything else basically they don't presume that you've watched the previous episodes i guess that's good but but for, for binge watchability, it was just something that stood out to me. So we have the return of the Velociraptor, and this time instead of chasing lizards around a uh, around a pack of Tarbosaurs, we have the Velociraptor scaling the cliff, climbing down towards the Pterosaurs to try and capture one without startling the entire colony and watching their lunch fly away. So we see them go down this really sharp cliff and David Attenborough in his narration talks about how they are able to do this thanks to their light weight because of their hollow bones and their feathering which helps them balance like the feathers on their on their arms the feathers on their tails it all helps them slowly jump down and sort of catch their fall in that regard even though it is again a group of raptors that we saw in the previous episode there's not a lot of um, camaraderie, I guess I should say. Maybe that's the wrong word. But even though the three of them go down together and there seems to be maybe a little bit of coordination with um, one of them approaching from above and two others approaching from below. You know, that's when the attack comes, not from the front, but from above and below apparently in the end uh, during like like they do capture one of the pterosaurs they kill it but there's a lot of commotion as the whole colony is like what the frick just happened and in that commotion their their catch falls down the cliff and only one of the velociraptors dares to go down and actually chase that meal chase that carcass and it says quite specifically that the female the velociraptor that went down to fetch the carcass she has her meal but the two other velociraptors are are on their own they have to catch their own meal so it's not a very social group i guess you would say you maybe would expect them to share the meal that they more or less caught together but the female just takes off with her snack and the two males are left to uh, to catch another one which is not something we see by the way the episode then moves on to the next dinosaur of the episode and that is another returning dinosaur namely the tyrannosaurus in the previous episode oh no excuse me in the first episode the tyrannosaurus the premiere of the series itself was presented as kind of a peaceful scavenger almost and that has garnered some um some disappointing reactions uh, in my own comment section of, as well with people like, oh, this is like the Jack Horner version of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I don't like that. And I did know that we have more of the Tyrannosaurus Rex coming based on the trailer. So I was like, let's hold off, folks. Let's hold off. We know that at some point a T-Rex roars right by a dead Triceratops. So I will say it was a little bit disappointing to see that even though the fact that the Tyrannosaurus successfully killed this Triceratops and it's mentioned in the narration that it is a ferocious carnivore 
and a really great hunter, which sort of balances out that scavenger taken the Tyrannosaurus from the very first episode. We don't see the Tyrannosaurus do anything ferocious. I guess that's how I would put it. Yes, it has, yes, it has taken down this Triceratops, but that's all in the past. That's been done. Uh, there was apparently quite a battle because the Tyrannosaurus is quite hurt from taking down the Triceratops, but we don't see any of that. We don't see any of that action. But what I think might happen is that they're building up towards some sort of big epic scene like that of maybe one big carnivore fighting another big carnivore or a big carnivore taking down a strong herbivore like Triceratops. I think they're building up to that. At least I hope so. I would like to see a scene like that. That being said, you know, without knowing if that's what we're gonna get or not, I still really like where they take the Tyrannosaurus Rex story in this particular episode. It's very anti-aggressive, but I really like it in the sense of like subverting expectations, even though even though that term is like triggering at this point. But what happens is the T-Rex is injured, so he goes to the river to wash his wound to to stay off infection. That is the freshwater tie-in to the Tyrannosaurus Rex's story. And as he does that, it is a male, by the way, as the male T-Rex washes his wound in the river, another T-Rex approaches. And in the way that the scene is shot and in the narration, you know, it's clearly meant to, to amp up the tension and the drama and to make you think, oh, there's gonna be a big battle. But in the end, what happens is the new approaching Tyrannosaurus Rex is actually a female. And the male is like, hey, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> so what he does is he displays like this spot on his chin, which again is like a reference to modern day animals and their like their mating displays, I guess, to, to phrase it that way. Uh, so he's like, I would rather mate <laughs> than fight you. <laughs> and the female goes along with that. So she also, she mimics his display essentially. And then they go into the forest and they make sweet, sweet love. <laughs> so, so it was again, quite a peaceful display of Tyrannosaurus, which I really like, but I do really hope that we do end up seeing a bit of Tyrannosaurus Rex action. And I think that will happen. I think the Tyrannosaurus Rex will sort of bookend the entire series. It has appeared in the first episode. It has now appeared in the middle episode. I think it'll make an epic return in the final episode. That is really what I'm thinking and what I'm keeping my fingers crossed for. With the not safe for work Tyrannosaurus Rex content done and dusted, we move over to the Dinochirus little storyline, and it really is little. Uh, they've released pretty much the full clip on Apple TV Plus on their YouTube channel, I mean, and it's just the Dinochirus uh, feeding on freshwater plants using his claws and his duck bill and all of that, and we see like his feathery, fluffy coat, which is infested by blood-sucking flies, which does not sound comfortable, and it isn't. So the Dinochirus uses a dead tree to scratch that persistent itch. That was all fine, I was perfectly okay with that. Again, it was a return of that humor that I mentioned in the previous two episodes as well, especially with the soundtrack. The soundtrack really amped up the humor for this particular scene. But I was watching this episode while I was eating, so I did not quite appreciate the emphasis that the scene then put on the Dinochirus droppings, to put it to put it mildly. Like we see a Dinochirus uh, delivery dissolve in the water that it's standing in and eating from. And like I was saying, I was eating while watching this episode, so I was not the biggest fan of that. But I guess, you know, that's nature, so it had to be addressed. But it felt very close to David Attenborough telling a poop joke. Not quite sure how I feel about that. The next part was probably the most epic and most exciting part of this episode for me personally, and that was the appearance of the Quetzalcoatlus. It is absolutely enormous and it's weird looking and it's amazing and I'm really 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 happy with how they took their time showing off this 
really unusual, enormous flying reptile. Uh, what we follow in the scene in the story is a female Quetzalcoatlus who is using like this swampy area for her nesting grounds. So she's flying in, she's making her nest, and it takes her like three weeks to produce and lay all of her eggs, like a dozen in total. And we get like this little time lapse scene of her staying by the nest and laying more eggs and stuff like that. And I thought that was really nicely done. It really felt like, you know, they had set up a camera in the prehistoric wilderness and were capturing that behavior. So I thought that was really nice. The only downside for me in how they portrayed the Quetzalcoatlus, or rather how they showcased the Quetzalcoatlus, is that they never put it side by side with a dinosaur or creature or something else that truly shows the scale of this animal. Uh, I, I'm really missing having the Quetzalcoatlus, for example, eat a smaller dinosaur, something like that. I think that would have been really cool. For example, have the Quetzalcoatlus eat a Velociraptor. I don't know, but something like that to put their skill into perspective. Now, the Quetzalcoatlus scene continues with uh, an older female actually finding the nest that we saw being being made and being filled with eggs. And the older female pretty much decimates the nest with the exception of three eggs. The younger female, she she intervenes, they have a little fight, like they 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 bite at each other. And the older female eventually leaves. She she's chased off, but by then the damage is already done, and only three eggs survived the attack. And the story basically ends with just saying that the mother Quetzalcoatlus will stay protecting those final three eggs until they hatch, but after that the hatchlings are completely on their own. Um, what I'm missing is, like, the continuation of the story. I feel like it reminds me of the Walking with Dinosaurs episode with, like, the baby sauropods, and we see them grow from these tiny, teeny little sauropods just scurrying along the forest floor to these huge sauropods, not even fully grown, but huge sauropods in the desert being chased by Allosaurus. And I realized that that is something that so far I am missing from Prehistoric Planet, following a single species over a longer period of time. That is something that maybe Walking with Dinosaurs did a little bit better, but you know, they've chosen a different approach here, and I really can't fault them for that. But I just wanted to point out that comparison between the two shows. The next dinosaur that is introduced is the Mashikasaurus. That's how David Attenborough pronounces it. Sort of. I can't quite mimic it. Uh, I previously called it the Masiakasaurus, but he calls it the Mashikasaurus. And they are introduced through this kind of cute and, again, funny scene where, you know, we're, we're on the riverbed, and um, these crabs are popping up all over the place and all of a sudden this dinosaur is snatching them up and eating them. And, and as opposed to first showing the dinosaur, they first show like some of these crabs going back into their holes and crawling away like, you did not see me, I am not here, please do not eat me. And again, that, that was just another great example of the humor in this series. Uh, but yeah, we then have the machete. Oh god, I forgot how it's pronounced. Mashaikasaurus? <laughs> I'm so sorry, I, for I forget. Like, literally from one minute to the next, I forget how we pronounce it. But the dinosaur feasts on crabs, and it is then revealed that she has babies, as so many babies are introduced in this series so far. And as is the case with so many babies in this series so far, they don't all survive. Uh, the Beasle Bufo, the huge giant frog, snatches one of them up. And that was pretty brutal to see, not gonna lie. It made me a little bit uncomfortable to see that baby, like, get swallowed whole. Pretty sure it was still alive as well. And the final animal to get showcased in the episode is the Elasmosaurus. It tells this story of, like, Elasmosaurus, yes, they live out at sea but sometimes they swim up river just a little bit to explore those waters and to to hunt where the river basically dumps into the ocean because that's very rich with uh, fish. <laughs> so they, they come over there to hunt the fish and that is essentially the end of the episode, which came 
quite abruptly, I would say. Overall, I think that this is so far my least favorite episode. I'm not quite sure. I think what I need to do is when they've all released, I need to watch them back to back to really make up my mind about that. Uh, me saying that it's my least favorite so far doesn't mean that it is bad at all. Again, engaging, entertaining, uh, brutal baby murder. <laughs> it's a great thing to come home to and to sit down and watch these episodes. I absolutely, absolutely love it and I can't wait for tomorrow's episode. Of course, if you also want to be here for my discussion of tomorrow's episode, then subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, all that stuff, and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching, liking, subscribing, and until next time, enjoy prehistoric planets. Mm -hmm.